Daniel chapter 3 tonight. Be reading verses 8 through 12. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Title of the message tonight, Anger Makes You Irrational. Let's pray. Lord, we need you tonight. Pray that you would work in this service. May each of us be willing to be honest before you in light of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. May we desire to adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Lord, may we adorn your gospel, your message. May we live so as that the word of God is not blasphemed. Lord, I pray that we'd be examples of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit, faith and purity. And Lord, to do that, we need to grow in grace. We need to yield ourselves to you. We need to be honest. So I pray as we look at your word tonight that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're still dealing with fools from the book of Proverbs, only now we're looking at anger in the book of Daniel. Don't worry, we haven't lost our way. It's just that anger is one of the characteristics of fools, and so we are looking at illustrations of anger in the Word of God. There are a lot of examples, because anger, like pride, is a universal problem. And it's a common problem. And so God has given us a lot of verses dealing with it. So the Bible lets us see many manifestations of anger in people's lives in order to help us. Whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning. They're written to help us, to train us, and, and to raise us up. So we left off last time in the middle of this story. And Nebuchadnezzar and his pride, and pride and anger are first cousins, by the way, uh, has set up an image, an idol, and demanded that everyone fall down and worship it. Uh, to not do so would be punished by death. The question came up last week after last week's message, did Daniel bow? And uh, because he's not recorded here, I think the answer is no. You look at Daniel 1.8, Daniel purposed in his heart. While still a young man, he purposed in his heart. He would not defile himself in, in a position where it would have been easy to go along with uh, the program in a new country, a new climate, new language, new people, new everything, even a new name. His body was made differently, uh, made different as a result of being a eunuch. Uh, everything had changed in his life. The language had changed. The education changed. And yet Daniel said, I'm not going to change. I'm going to still worship God. He purposed in his heart. That just simply means he made up his mind. Made up his mind. He was not going to defile himself uh, with, with the opportunities that were there in front of him. And so he, evidently he, he was at home, perhaps when the music started, not out in public, uh, or could have been traveling on behalf of the king's business. Daniel had uh, so proved himself that he quickly rose through the ranks. Daniel 2.48, then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. That's a great responsibility. And chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king in the highest positions of authority and power. That's where Daniel was. 
And it was through his influence that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be uh, promoted. And you go all the way to chapter 6. It pleased Darius, a subsequent king, to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and that and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And so Daniel was in a, a positions of great influence. Uh, God blessed him. Uh, God used him. And uh, it would appear that Daniel did not have to uh, take a stand on this issue. He, he certainly would have, I believe. Uh, he would take a stand in chapter 6, get thrown in the lion's den. Uh, but he evidently was not around when the music started playing. So three Hebrew children were. Uh, they were evidently out in public one day when the music started up. You know, there are a lot of games where when the music stops, you might lose. Musical chairs and, I don't know, uh, what, hot potato and things like that. This was one where uh, when the music starts, you can get in trouble. And sure enough, the three Hebrew children are, are out where they're visible and uh, they get in serious trouble. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in trouble because somebody turned them in. Daniel 3.12, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They've not regarded you. Now they don't even respect you, king. And uh, they don't serve your gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And so the king is instantly irate. He's incensed that somebody dared to defy him. Somebody dared to uh, not follow his orders. Verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king in his rage and fury to just be informed that somebody would not bow down when the music was played. In verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true? Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And so he offers them a chance to, to make amends and to, uh, to get it right. Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well... But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Three Hebrew children had, had a lot of outs here that they could have, uh, they could have uh, said, okay, king, we appreciate the, another chance. And then they could have just determined, man, we're, we've got to be careful when we go out. We've got to make sure there's a place we can uh, duck into if the music starts. Or they could have even bowed down and, and when the music's playing and said, Lord, we're, they think we're worshiping the golden image, but we're actually praying to you and, and uh, it's all good. There are a lot of things they could have done. But, and they could have even just waited until it happened again. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. King, you need to understand we serve a God that's fully capable of, of delivering us out of this burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us, but if not... If not, if he doesn't, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, keep in mind, they're talking to a king that has the power of life and death in his hands, and he's already enraged. This isn't just a casual conversation in his office. They've come before the king, and he's, he's popping blood vessels right now. He, he's angry. And they said, King, look, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does, it doesn't make any difference, King. We're not, we're not going to bow down. And so you see, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed. You could see the fury in his face. His countenance was changed. He's, he's steaming mad. Changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. 
It's hard to reason with an angry man. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. This was a foolish, irrational decision. Verse 21, then these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In chapter 2, you remember, he, he would have destroyed all his wise men were it not for Daniel's wise intervention that saved the day. Irrationally, he commanded all the wise men to be killed because they couldn't recount the dream that he'd had. They couldn't, he couldn't remember. He had it, couldn't remember, and he expects them to come up with it. They try to reason with him. King, no, no, nobody's ever asked that of anybody. Nobody can do that. Nobody in the world can do that. No king or ruler's ever asked that. It didn't make any difference. He's going to have them killed. And Daniel intervenes. Otherwise, otherwise, the king would have wiped out his cabinet. He would have wiped out his wise men just because of anger. Anger is so irrational, so destructive. And so here in chapter 3, he does destroy his most mighty men. So angry, oh, heat the furnace seven times hot. It's not going to make any difference. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if they had been killed in the fire, they'd just been killed sooner. But he's just so angry. He just wants to do whatever uh, to get at them. And so he destroys his most mighty men. Anger is destructive. In chapter 6, Daniel's cast into the den of lions because of the pride of a foolish king. Anger and pride usually go together. And notice Nebuchadnezzar's question in, in verse 15. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? He didn't know. Well, what God can deliver you out of my hands? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was something. And really, humanly speaking, he was. The kingdom was incredible. So even subsequent to this, he'd walk in the palace and, and, and say, wow, is not this great Babylon that I have made by the might of my hands? He was pretty proud of himself. Who is that God that can deliver you out of my hands? Remember Pharaoh's question of Moses and Aaron? Exodus 5, 1, afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and and let Israel go? I, I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. You know, it's interesting because both Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh would get their questions answered in in regards to who the Lord is. They'd find out. Oh, who's the Lord? Who's the Lord? Daniel 3, 28, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no god, no other god that can deliver after this sort." The king still kind of worked up a little bit, you know, and so somebody's going to pay. But now it's don't say anything against the true and living God. The one said, who is that God? Well, he knows now. He said, man, that God's pretty powerful. I I think we want to be on his his good side. And so it was with Pharaoh as well. Numbers 33, 3, it says they departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. Remember when they finally are are, uh, ushered out of the land on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn. The final plague, remember, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. All those plagues were, were judgments upon their particular gods, the, the frog god and the, the god of the Nile River and, and so on. Say, so, hey, who, who's the Lord? I don't know the Lord. He's going to find out the Lord's far more powerful than any of the gods of the Egyptians. And so you know, you know the story from Exodus. You take 
Pharaoh's pride, you take his stubbornness, you take his anger, and then the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart further after, after Pharaoh had hardened his own heart, and, and you have a toxic combination. And so even after the, after the plagues, each plague, and you see, you see Pharaoh struggling there, and after the, after the hail in Exodus 9.27, it says, and, and Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time, I have sinned. The Lord is righteous. He said, who's the Lord? Now he knows. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. That, that's quite a, a pronouncement from the Pharaoh. Uh, this is an unregenerate man. The, the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are, are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and, and I will let you go, and, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. This is what you're saying now, Pharaoh, but I, I know you're going to renege on this. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, spread abroad his hands unto the Lord. The thunders and the hail ceased. The rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. And, and how often you see that in society and how often when people are in trouble and things are, aren't going well and, and people that aren't, aren't believers and they'll be crying out to God and making all kinds of promises and God, if you'll only do this and you take care of that, you'll heal my sick daughter. And they're, they're making all these uh, vows to God and then when everything's good again, it's like they go back to what they were. And here Pharaoh hardens his heart harder, and the Lord would use all of that so that everyone would know who he was. Exodus 10, 2, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh, said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long? How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Pharaoh's pride was getting in the way. How long before you'll humble yourself? Let my people go that they may serve me. Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast, and, and they shall cover the face of the earth. So finally, Pharaoh's servants come to him. And Exodus 10, 7, Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go. Pharaoh, what are you thinking? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? This was actually pretty brazen of them to come. But the Pharaoh had the, had the power of life and death. But his servants are just perplexed to see plague after plague after plague after plague. They're seeing the country destroyed. And they say, Pharaoh, let him go. Can't you see that, that our land is destroyed? Let him go. But anger is irrational. It's hard to reason with an angry man. Every person in here, every person in here has stories of having to deal with with an angry person or angry people. All of us could stand up and we just do a testimony night that night. Tell an experience with an angry person. Uh, we have all kinds of, why? Because anger is pervasive in our society. I remember years ago when we were, back when I was a youth director and we had gone up on the, up by Wrightwood there to go, to go tubing. And uh, we had uh, a lot of inner tubes and we had the bus, we went up there and well, we discovered that the mountain we picked, that there's, there's a spot that if you, if you went down this particular spot, it would lead you right towards this little tree root that stuck up through the snow, and, and it, would, it would pop your tube. And it, it took us a while to discover that. After we lost a couple of tubes, we figured it out. But <clears throat> both the tubes we lost were just kind of a slow leak, and we, we figured it out. And so if, if you went over on this one side, it just channels everybody to that root. 
So we told all the teens, hey, get over, you know, move over and come over here. And, and uh, so we, <clears throat> we had tube for, I don't know, three or four hours, had a good time. And we were getting ready to leave. Trying to get everybody down, rowing one last ride, get on the bus. And, and, and this man pulls up and parks right in front of the bus, just a little bit in front of the bus. And he gets out, he opens his trunk, and he has one inner tube in his trunk. One inner tube. His wife and about a 10-year-old kid. So they get out, they go trudging up the mountain. Well, he goes right to the wrong spot. And I said, hey, sir, sir, you don't want a tube there. That'll put you right down. He just waves me off. <laughs> waves me off. Gets on his tube, goes, sure enough, and he doesn't get a slow leak. His explodes. Bam! And he's got nothing but a flat piece of rubber that he, you know, he's just stopped dead. Well, Teenagers, especially junior hires, don't have a lot of public decorum. <laughs> and they'd been witness to all this. They'd known we lost a couple tubes. They'd seen me try to tell the guy. And so they just, they think that's pretty funny. Well, this guy's really mad. And they're, I'm, get on the bus, get on the bus, you guys are gonna get killed. And he's up there just uh, yelling and stomping about. And, and so by the time we load the bus, he's, he's coming down off the mountain with his pop tube and his wife and his kid they get in the car and pride and anger he just, he just had to listen I don't know how far away he drove but his whole day consisted of driving up there getting half a ride down the mountain and going back home it, uh, it hurts us it hurts us when we, when we can't take advice we think we know what we're doing it hurts us when we have so much anger. The Bible says anger resteth in the bosom of fools. It doesn't take much to just bring it out. In Bible college, I, I worked at Sunbeam Bakery in Phoenix one summer, just between, between uh, the Bible college years, went back to Phoenix and worked in this bakery for, a, for about three months. And my job was the bread just comes on a conveyor belt. When it gets out of the oven, it goes and travels around this conveyor belt for really quite a while till it cools off, and then they, it gets automatically put in the, the wrappers and, you know, everything. And then it comes upstairs, and upstairs you just have to take, you take five loaves at a time, and you slide it onto a tray and five more loaves, and then you have the tray filled, put that on the rack, and you just do that all day long, and the racks go out to the dock, and the trucks come at like three in the morning, pick it all up. And so when you're doing like white bread or wheat breads, things like that, it, it's not going real fast because they don't want you to handle that real fast. They, want, they don't want to get smashed. But when you're doing like rye or pumpernickel and some of those, it's coming off pretty, pretty rapidly. And so you have to have all your racks and all your trays and everything all set up. And, and then when that starts coming, you just got to be, you got to keep moving. So there was only two conveyor belts that ended upstairs. And so I'm at my conveyor belt. And this other guy behind me, he's about, probably about 50 feet away. He's at his conveyor belt. Well, he starts getting behind. And so then he just, you just push the bread, he pushes the bread back. Well, then now it's coming real fast when it comes because there's not even a gap between it. And he's trying to keep up and bread just plopping on the floor and he's catching some of it. And he just starts yelling and getting madder and madder and madder. I can't help him because then my bread had started doing that. So I hear him getting louder and louder and finally he just loses it. Blank, blank, just taking bread and just chucking it all over the warehouse and <laughs> kicking bread. And, I mean, bread's just flying everywhere. And I'm over here, wow, you know, just trying to keep my bread going. And, and in the middle of all of that, bread just going everywhere. I mean, really, he's punting it and throwing it and yelling. And supervisor comes walking up, and I'm still doing my bread. You know? <laughs> and uh, honestly, if it, if it hadn't been a union job, he'd have been done. Uh, he just got put on whatever, you know, for however many days. But anger, anger, it's, it's so destructive, so harmful. And if we'd sit down and we'd think about it enough, we'd think, you know, it, nothing ever good comes of this. You know, we like to call it righteous indignation. It might be about one time out of 100. There are some times to get angry over things, but most of the time, we're just, we're just upset. And we want to justify it. And, and, and we hurt relationships. We hurt our testimony. We, we hurt so many things. And, and, and you parents, you need, to, you need to be concerned when you see your kids 
exhibit anger. It's not cute. And it's not just going to go away on its own. It's not just going to be automatically eradicated. It's a serious thing. One more story. James is here. I remember years ago. <clears throat> no, this is good on James. Um, <clears throat> in Little League, well, he did strike out. So he struck out. <laughs> and when he came back to the dugout, James was smiling. And the coach was like, you shouldn't be, you should be, and, he, and he's all upset with James because James is smiling and he struck out. Do you remember this? You cried. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's, he's uh, smiling and the coach is just, you should be upset and, and you should be mad. And, and so I waited till all that calmed down and then, and then the next batter's up and people are watching the game and I, and I pulled the coach and I, I said, listen, I said, don't, don't interfere with how we raise our kids. I said, we taught him to not get upset, throw the bat down and throw his glove down. We taught our kids that. We don't want them mad just because they strike out. Everybody's going to say, you play baseball long enough, you're going to strike out. I said, don't, don't do that with my kids. You can coach how you want, but don't do that with my kids. And he backed down. But I, you, you, have to, you have to guard your kids because coaches can teach them to be angry. Uh, teachers can teach them in the public school, not in our Christian school, to be angry. Uh, other adults can monitor, model uh, anger. Uh, anger is toxic. And so, so, well, he's only two. He just kind of has a temper. Terrible twos. The Bible doesn't say kids have to go through terrible. You have to deal with that. You have to take that seriously. Um, you don't want them to grow up to be angry young people and angry adults. And so that's on us, parents. We need to, we need to be careful. We have examples all through the Bible of how destructive anger and, and pride are. Proverbs 17, 19, he loveth transgression that loveth strife. Some people just, that's how they live their life. And he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. Pride, how it leads to so many things. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before honor is humility. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. And by the way, it's not just men who have a problem with anger. Plenty of women do too. Newsflash. Proverbs 21.9. It's better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Now, just in case you're a little sleepy or distracted when you read this verse, when you keep on reading, you come to chapter 25, and it says it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Yeah, it seems like I read that just a couple chapters ago. By nature, we try to choose the better of two options or more. You know, you go to the grocery store, you want to buy watermelon. You ever see people, there's some people will knock on every one of them. They're trying to find the best watermelon that's there. Uh, you know, multiple choice test answers. And sometimes it's choose the best answer. And you think, man, I'm not sure. And, hey, we want to get the best option. A uh, meal in a restaurant. You look at the rent menu and you want to get what, what sounds good. And you order something. And then the person you're with, they order something. When theirs comes, it's like, oh, man, I should have ordered that. That just looks better, you know. So, um, but in these two verses in Proverbs, we have laid out for us two options. Choice number one, live in a corner of the housetop. Choice number two, live with a brawling woman in a wide house. And the word brawling, it means discord or strife, contention. So living with an angry woman. Up on the roof, you have wind, you have rain, you have sleet, maybe you have snow in, in certain climates, certain areas. You have lightning, you have cold, you have heat. You say, man, that's, that's, that's pretty rough. No, 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 don't, don't feel sorry for that guy. Feel sorry for the guy that lives inside in a nice, big, wide house, but it's with a brawling woman. And that doesn't mean she's got massive biceps with tattoos on it. <laughs> I know you think brawling woman, you just picture something, you know, from, I don't know, some wild Louisiana woman or something, but it's just, it's just somebody that's, that's contentious, that's angry. The house is wide, not the woman. Brawling woman, okay? Um, but it says, 
pity that guy. He, he's got the worst deal. He, he, he's the one that uh, neither guy got a good deal, but guy number two got the worst deal. And here's another guy with a tough choice. Proverbs 21, 19. It, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and, and an angry woman. Wow. You know, choice number one, this option includes everything that the guy on the roof got, but now this guy has to hunt his own food. He's got to go find water. He may have to fend off wild animals. And choice number two, we're not told what kind of house is included in this package, whether it's big and wide, we don't know, but we're told the kind of woman who lives in it. She's contentious. She, she's angry, and, and God's Word says, hey, man, run for the hills. You're better off in the wilderness. That's a modern translation, but, but, but that's what it's saying. That, you know, you're better off without all of the comforts of home than to have the tension and the turmoil and the anger all the time and wonder if this is gonna set her off or this is gonna make her mad. And, uh, Proverbs 17 once says, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Well, you have all the good food and the refrigerator is full and the cupboards are full, but there's strife. There's, there's tension. There's, there's, there's fighting. And the Proverbs 15, 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. He says, you're better off just with a salad. <laughs> you vegetarians. He's not saying that's better. He's saying it's just better if you don't have the fighting you stalled ox, that fatted calf, that, man, that's a great meal. He said, no, not, not if there's hatred with it. Ecclesiastes 4, 6, better is than a handful, just a little bit, than, than quiet, and with quietness, than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. And it's, it's an, again, there's so many word pictures in the Bible, and, and this, is a, this is another interesting one, a continual dropping in a rainy day uh, in, in Bible times, and even to this day in, in a lot of Mediterranean areas, that it's a flat roof. And so the rain would come, and a lot of times it's earthen or it's thatch, something of that nature, and the rain would come, and, and you're sitting inside, and it's, you're, it's nice and dry. But if that rain rains long enough, guess what? Eventually, it kind of just makes its way down through. And even after the sun comes back out, guess what happens inside? Drip, drip, drip. You're thinking the storm's over, and it's dripping on you. And that's the, that's the picture he gives uh, for a contentious woman. And the poor guy's sitting there thinking the storm's over, and she's going, drip, 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 drip. <laughs> that's, that's the picture. That's the Bible picture that, hey, just let it go. It's over with. Don't worry. There's nothing we can do about it now. One guy said, you know, when my wife gets mad, he says, then she gets, she gets historical. And the guy says, you mean hysterical? No, historical. She brings up everything. <laughs> um, just, just let it go. And so the next verse says, whosoever hideth her hideth the wind and the ointment of his right hand which bereath itself. You can't hide the wind. So you can't hide this one. Shh, you can't hide her. Or the, or your perfume, you can't hide it. And so by contrast, you have Proverbs 31.10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. And so a, a virtuous woman is hard to find and a contentious woman's hard to, hard to hide. That's what the Bible's saying. And so consider that these warnings on the one hand and recommendations on the other come from the, the same God who, who said this. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and, and they shall be one flesh. And seven times in six days, God saw what he, was, what he had created, and he pronounced it good. Seven times in six days, in the six days of creation. And then you, when you come to the end of the sixth day, we read this, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Very good. And indeed it was. And, and it's still good, even though sin has marred and, and scarred much of it. But then even before sin entered the world, 
God finds something in regards to creation that he pronounces not good. Seven times, this is good, this is good, this is good. That's very good. And now in Genesis 2, 18, the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That makes what we, what we read in Proverbs all the more astounding. God's going through creation. This is good, this is good, that's good, this is good. And then he comes to man all alone and no partner in life. And he says, ah, oh, that's not good. But then you come to Proverbs and God says, but if you got the choice and, and she's contentious, you'd have been better off staying in the woods, pal, than, than with this woman. The same God that says not good that man should be alone. You say, but you're better off without a contentious, angry woman. So, and ladies, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you the Bible here, you know. Um, we've been picking on the men a while. So, so, but men and women, all of us can get angry, can get impatient, can get out of sorts, can, can, can take a, uh, you've had a bad day. Don't take it out on your spouse. That's not fair. Just because you had a bad day, don't, misery loves company, don't, don't take it out on them. But, but all of us probably, we have some breaking point somewhere. We have to guard against that. We have to be careful that we would not mistreat the people we claim to love the most, oftentimes. Emphasizes again, we must not minimize our anger. It's, it's a big deal to God. Horace said, anger is a short madness. GM Trevelyan said, anger is a momentary madness, so control your passion or it will control you. Years ago, Eleanor Roosevelt said, anger is one letter short of danger. It's true. Sidney Harris said, if a small thing has the power to make you angry, does that not indicate something about your size? Louis L'Amour said, anger is a killing thing. It kills the man who angers, for each rage leaves him less than he had before. It takes something from him. And Mark Twain said, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. The book of Esther is another great study on the, on the subject of anger. Now, once again here, we, we see its association with pride. Esther chapter 3, after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now, Haman had just had a, a big promotion. He, everything's going well. He's... he's, he's upwardly mobile. Everything's going fine in his career. The king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? There's always somebody. There's always somebody ready to turn you in. There's always somebody. Hey, she's not wearing her mask. Hey, he's not. Uh, there's always somebody out there. And it came to pass when they spake daily unto him and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And here you have a man that's swelled up with pride now. He's been, he's been advanced in the kingdom and everybody's supposed to pay him homage and everybody's supposed to do obeisance and, and he's getting where he really likes that and he expects that. And so he has this great position in the kingdom. His career is going well. 99.9% .9 of the king's subjects are doing this. But one man won't do it. Hey, you know what the king said? I'm, I'm a Jew. I only bow to God. I only bow to the true and living God. So somebody had to point him out to him. Haman, Haman didn't even see him. They'd come to, hey, Haman, you know, when you're leaving in the day, there's that guy out there. He doesn't bow. Did you notice? No, no. Yeah, around the corner, by the side over there on the right side. And, and so they point out where, where Mordecai is. So now when Haman, Haman's thinking as he's leaving for the day, where's that guy? Where? And he's upset already. And, and then sure enough, he walks by and, and Mordecai doesn't bow. And the Bible says he's full of wrath. How was his life affected? Did this cost him financially? 
Did this hurt his family? Did this hurt his career aspirations? It didn't hurt him at all, except in his pride. So he's full of wrath, full of wrath, that one person won't bow. And you're going to find, if you don't deal with a problem with anger, anybody can come into your life and mess it up. Doesn't take much. Just be impatient with everything after a while. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. That's why the Bible says if you don't have a rule over your own spirit, you're like a city that's broken down without walls because anybody can come marching through at any time. And so here, this, this, this simple Jew that won't bow, and Haman's, he's full of wrath. He, he's angry about this, that this, that this would be. And, and we're not going into any depth here for sake of time, but this is a great story. If you haven't ever read it, you should. It's a funny story, but it's a good story. A lot of, a lot of great lessons. And actually, uh, Haman's not the first angry man mentioned in the book. If you, if you back it up to the very first, Esther 1 came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India unto Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even in a hundred and fourscore days. So again, you're dealing with somebody that, that's a proud man. And he rules over a very impressive empire. Humanly speaking, we, people would say he has every right to be proud. This is a, a powerful uh, leader. And, and so he has, it's a one half year promotional feast for probably thousands of people. He has 127 provinces. So he's bringing in the dignitaries. He's bringing in the leaders. He's bringing them in and, and he's going to wine and dine them for 180 days. This is a pretty long time to, to show off his kingdom. Uh, and it, it climaxed in a huge week-long banquet. You know, when these days were expired, the 180, so he's already knocked off half a year. When these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small. So not just the leaders from all of these outlying regions. Everybody can come to this massive banquet seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen, purple to silver rings, and pillars of marble, and the beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. I mean, this was a spectacular thing. And, and they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. For what that's worth, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. So they didn't force anybody or compel them to, uh, but it was there, plenty for everybody. And also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So the men are over here drinking it up, and, and the women are over there at their feast. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded me human, these are great names, you know how you have to check on, on the thing sometimes. I'm not a robot. Well, that's what this guy, me human, Bizha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abigtha, Zethar, and Carcass. So if you want Bible names for your kids, there's seven of them right there. That, <laughs> the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty for she was fair to look on. You know, drunk people do stupid things. His, his heart was merry with wine. He'd been drinking a while. And he gets the idea that, hey, I'm going to bring the queen in. I got all these drunken people here. This would be a good time to bring the queen in. And so they, they go to tell the queen. And the queen's like, no, I don't think that's happening. I'm not, I'm not going there. Yeah, they're all drunk. They want you to come. No, no. Uh, verse 12, the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him. He's not used to being told no. And, and he's, he's going to lose face here. This whole thing was to show everybody how great his kingdom was, how magnificent everything was. He's wined and dined everybody for half a year. Now he brings in everybody for this seven-day big feast. 
And, and after, after he's been drinking himself drunk and he gets the bright idea that, hey, I'm gonna show off my wife to everybody so they can see how pretty she is. And so they summon Vashti and say, hey, the king wants you to come over there and, and uh, he wants everybody to see how pretty you are. And she's like, he's been drinking again, huh? No, that's in, that's in Hebrew. But um, no, no, she knew what was going on. And so she's not about to go over there. That, that, that was not a, not a good thing to do. And so uh, the king, he's drunk, he's angry. He gets advice on what to do from the quote-unquote wise men uh, who have probably also been drinking. Verse 15, what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king of Ahasuerus. King, she's, she's messing us all up, you know. Uh, for this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king of Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. So they're afraid it's going to go a little rougher for them at home, and they won't be able to order their wife around quite as well. And likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. And so what happens? The queen is deposed and banished. And we're out of time. But all of that because of anger. Pride and anger and anger and pride. And so the king says, okay. Yeah, she can't be queen anymore. We're, we're done with her. We make really irrational, self-destructive decisions oftentimes that hurt us, hurt people around us because of anger. That's why the Bible has so much to say about it. And for you and me, we have the greatest opportunity to let our light shine when we don't give place to anger. At your job, big stack of pallets you've just piled up, it all comes tumbling down. If you get mad just like everybody else, then you're just like everybody else. But when you don't, or maybe you smash your thumb with a hammer and you don't get mad, you don't say things a Christian ought not say, that's when your testimony is the strongest. That's when your example shines the brightest. Things don't go well, and you can still smile. You can still have a joyful spirit. That's, that's when your testimony is the most radiant. When we respond just like the average lost guy, we lose a great opportunity. And we get angry just like everybody else. And I'm not saying, there's nobody here who say, yeah, the rest of my life, I'm never getting angry again. But we ought to take it seriously because it's a serious thing. And, and we can do a lot of harm to our testimony. Or we can reflect well on our God, let our light shine that we may glorify our Father. Others will glorify Him too. They'll notice. Things happen in your life, things happen at work, things happen where other people can see, and you don't give place to that angry spirit. You don't vent and yell and carry on, get upset with somebody, treat somebody differently. My wife and I were just in a place, and a, a father was sitting there with his son, and the, the son spilled a, a cup of juice or something at the table, and the father instantly angry. Boy, you can't take that back. You can't take that back. I, I felt bad for the kid, probably 10 years old. It's not like he did it on purpose. He's 10 years old. 10-year-olds do stupid things. Anybody in here 10? Sorry. No, nobody? Okay. That's just the nature of being 10. But you could just see, you could just see on the boy's countenance because his dad instantly flared up. And I thought, how sad. How sad. It, we're going to have things happen in life. We're going to have inconveniences. We're going to have accidents. We're going to spill things. Other people are going to spill things on us. Things are going to break. Things aren't going to go well. And boy, the human reaction is just flare up and get mad. So destructive. So many ways. And you say, well, man, I've been this way for 30 years or 40 years or 
then take it serious. Don't say, well, this is just the way I am, no hope for me. No, I'd, I'd get up every day and I'd get my Bible and I'd spend time with God. Say, God, I've been an angry man for 45 years. I don't want to be an angry man anymore. God, I've been an angry woman for 30 years. I don't want to be an angry woman anymore. I don't want to be angry with my husband or angry with my kids or I don't want to be angry at my job. I don't want to be angry at, at the store. I don't want to be angry anymore. God, would you help me? Would you help me guard my mouth? Set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That's a pretty good prayer right from the Bible. Lord, help me with my attitude. Help me not to just lash out at people. Help me not to just say the first thought that comes to my head. Help me not react in a way that spills that venom, that toxin, that poison over everybody around me. I'd, I'd take it seriously. Because yeah, if, if you've been angry for 45 years, that's, that's second nature. That's what's gonna happen. And it's gonna keep on happening unless you get serious about it. Maybe you need to fast. Just say, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go without eating today and pray. And take the time, you eat breakfast at 15 or 20 minutes and just, just pray, Lord, would you keep me from getting angry today? Would you help me? Would you remind me? And lunchtime, same thing. Dinner time, same thing. Lord, it's more important to me to not be angry than to eat. I don't want to eat today. I just want to, I want to get victory in this area. I want to help in this area, God, because I've been blowing it a long time and making excuses. Lord, would you help me? Would you, would you give me victory? And maybe you fast two days or three days. Don't endanger your health, but maybe you, you go a while. Say, Lord, I'm that serious about it. I don't want to keep being this way. I don't want to keep being angry. For one thing, you're shortening your lifespan. You know that, don't you? You know, it's funny, as Christians, if someone's smoking, we'd be like, ah, they're smoking. Anger's just as bad. I'm not recommending either one. I'm not saying pick one, but uh, anger will shorten your lifespan too. It'll, it'll take years off your life. And, and so when we, when we recognize that, and we recognize that we're taking years off our life and maybe years off other people's lives that are around us all the time, and, and we're, we're hurting our testimony, and we're, we're driving crazy, and we might have a wreck, and we're gonna destroy things, and we say, Lord, this is a big deal. I've acted like it isn't. I've acted like, well, this is the way I grew up and so this is all I know and I've made all kinds of excuses. But God, I'm not gonna make excuses anymore. I'm gonna call it what it is, that it's sin. But God, I desperately need your help to get through this. God gives grace to the humble. He does. The first step in overcoming, getting victory over any sin is just calling it sin, being honest. Not this is a bad habit, this is the way I grew up, this is, this is just my Irish blood. You know, no, 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 just say this is sin. And, and I don't wanna keep on sinning. I don't wanna keep doing it. And if we'll be honest with God, and we'll be humble before God, because God does give grace to the humble, and he does resist the proud, we'll start having victory. And when you, when you blow up at somebody and you, you, you lose it, then go humble yourself. So you know, 30 minutes ago I said something to you that was wrong, and I'm sure sorry. And I'm coming to ask you to forgive me. And maybe it's, you didn't even say it to them, but at work, if you lose your testimony and say something you shouldn't or slam your fist down and then it'd be a good idea to go to the other coworkers and say, you know, I'm sorry for what I just did. I shouldn't have done that. Will you forgive me? They're gonna look at you like you're crazy, but that's all right. Better they think you're crazy that way than think, no, oh, he's just like we are. Gets angry just like we do. You say, man, that would be, yeah, that'd be humbling. But that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Remember, God gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, help us learn from it. Help us be honest. Help us grow. We need you, God. Every one of us tonight, we need you. All of us have areas of our lives where 
we've fallen way short. And Lord, anger is a pretty, pretty, common, pretty common sin. Help us to be serious about it. Help us to humble ourselves before you and before other people in whatever measure we need to. Bless now this invitation time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed.